Hello everyone, I once again uh, welcome you all to MSP lecture series on interpretive spectroscopy. In my previous lecture, I showed you how nicely phosphorus NMR can be used to detect or determine the number of epoxide groups present on carbon nanomaterials. Uh, it is very, very important, especially when you want to use pure nanomaterials for electronic and other semiconductor purposes. We have to ensure that there are no such parasites are sitting on graphene. From that point of view, this NMR spectroscopy, especially phosphorus NMR comes very handy. So let me continue from where I had stopped. So now let us look into uh, some important information regarding instrument operation as far as measurement of uh, 30 NP NMR spectra are concerned. So instrument operation will vary according to instrumentation and software available. It varies with different company instruments and, and the softwares employed there. However, there are a few important aspects to instrument operation relevant to 31 PNMR one should know uh, before they put their hands on instrument to measure 31 PNMR spectra. The instrument probe which excites nuclear spins and detects chemical shifts must be set up appropriately for a 31P NMR experiment. This is very, very vital. Of course, these guidelines will be given. Now for an instrument with a multinuclear probe, it is a simple matter to access the NMR software and make the switch to a 31P experiment. Again, technician will guide you in this one. This will select the appropriate frequency for 31P. For an instrument which has separate probes for a different nuclei, it is imperative that one be trained by an expert user in changing the probes in the spectrometer. So this is a typical NMR tube we are using and this is a capillary tube containing 85 percent phosphoric acid and this can be inserted and also we can measure. So for example here, before running the NMR experiment, consider whether the 31P spectrum should include coupling to protons or not and you should remember the fact that 31 pn spectra are typically reported with all protons decoupled. That is a default setup and this is usually the default setting for 31 pnmr experiment. To change the coupling setting, follow the instructions specific to your NMR instrument software and chemical shifts in 31 pnmr reported relative to 85 percent phosphoric acid. This must be an external standard due to the high reactivity of phosphoric acid. So one method for standardizing an experiment uses a coaxial tube inserted into the sample NMR tube I showed you in the last slide. So 85 percent phosphoric acid signal will appear as a part of the sample NMR spectrum and can thus be set to zero. So when you are measuring, you can also see signal due to phosphoric acid that you can set as zero and accordingly with reference to that one other chemical shifts can be set, automatically set. So this is the one as I mentioned, this is the capillary with phosphoric acid, a sealed capillary and then this can be inserted nicely. So another way to reference an NMR spectrum is to use 85 percent phosphoric acid as a standard sample. These can be prepared in the laboratory or it can be purchased commercially. It is very easy to make provided we have a glass blower in our laboratory. Uh, to allow for long term use, these samples are typically vacuum sealed. So then what is the procedure for using a separate reference? So insert NMR sample tube into the spectrometer, tune the 31P probe and shim the magnetic field according to your individual instrument procedure, remove NMR sample tube and insert phosphoric acid reference tube into spectrometer, begin NMR experiment as scans proceed, perform a Fourier transform and set the phosphorus signal to 0 ppm, continue to reference spectrum until the shift stops changing and stop experiment and remove phosphoric acid reference tube and insert NMR sample tube into spectrometer, run NMR experiment without changing the reference of the spectrum. So this is how you can do alternately referencing phosphoric acid when you are measuring 31 NMR signals. 
and when we are using 31 pn MR, it gives distinct sharp peaks that helps in identifying phosphorus containing new products and unreacted starting compounds and any other phosphorus impurities. So, that is the advantage and so 31 pn MR is very simple technique for assaying sample purity readily. A clean 31 pn MR spectrum does not necessarily suggest a pure compound but it can tell you that it is free of phosphorus containing impurities. There may be other organic impurities are there, but that can not tell you any further information, but only if the spectrum is clean, it would indicate you definitely that there are no phosphorus impurities or any other minor products containing phosphorus. 31 PNMR can also be used to determine the optical density of a chiral sample adding an enantiomer to the chiral mixture to form two different diastereomers will give rise to two unique chemical shifts in the 31p spectrum that probably at the end I will show you some examples. The ratio of these peaks can then be compared to determine the optical purity. So, now uh, let us look into a couple of more examples considering the reactions carried out uh, with organometallic compounds. Uh, with phosphorus containing compound especially phosphines. So, 31 PNMR can be used to monitor a reaction involving phosphorus compounds, no doubt in it. Consider the reaction of nickel cod twice is a nickel 0 compound with a slight excess of bisphosphine. So, I am going to show the chemical reaction here. So, this is the bisphosphine we are considering and then when it is treated with nickel cod, this type of nickel 0 compound is formed with some interaction with ortho carbon present here. So, still nickel is in 0 valent state and it is a 14 electron species and then this can be readily monitored. How to monitor? It is very simple. Take the ligand and add that one to the nickel card twice in an appropriate solvent and then initially the signal when you just begin the reaction you can see the signal due to only phosphine here with the time for example, after one hour you can see another peak started developing here much downfield. This indicates the beginning of the formation of this compound and then uh, two hours it is gradually concentration of ligand is decreasing and then this is slowly increasing. After three hours you can see steadily it goes and after five hours it is completely reacted and then if you just compare the integration you know that you have used slight excess of this one only the slight excess of bisphosphine usually is left unreacted that indicates the completion of the reaction. So, that means by using variable time 31 PNMR spectrum we should be able to monitor the reaction in a continuous process and see you can stop as soon as you come to know that the reaction is completed. Not only in this reaction when we are doing catalytic reactions also we can look into the consequences that are observed on phosphorus in a catalytic reaction can also be very nicely followed using 31 PNMR spectroscopy. So, now one more interesting example is there here that is with respect to cyclotriphosphazine. So, indicate the number of isomers of cyclic compounds of formula and sketch the 31 PNMR spectrum for each. So, in this case some hint is given assume delta is much larger than j and j p h is small. If j p h is small, j p h can be ignored for phosphorus atoms which do not contain methyl groups. That means, when you are writing like this, uh, we have two methyl groups are there and four chloro groups are there. If we write uh, all possible isomers, it so happens some of the uh, phosphorus atoms will not be having chlorine. In that case, they will be little farther from the methyl groups. In that case, what happens? The p h can be ignored. That means, we are plotting not decoupled one, we are plotting coupled one. What would happen if we take a, a decoupled one? It is straightforward. We have to identify how many different type of phosphorus environments are there in a given isomer. So, here yeah, only two isomers are possible, either having both the methyl groups on one phosphorus or two methyl groups are distributed on two different phosphorus. Since only we have two, so e either we can have this possibility or we can have this possibility. And in this one, if you are considering protons also, it would resemble A to M X 6 spin system or here what happens it would be A M 2 X 3 spin system. So, that means let us look into how the NMR is going to look like. Ignore A X coupling in both the cases. So, A X coupling because A and X are far apart, you can ignore the coupling. Only you can see 
uh, the direct coupling. So, here for example, it is a two bond pH coupling can be considered and rest of the long range coupling can be ignored. Now, if you just look into this one, these two are identical and this is different. So, that means basically when we look into if I say P A here and this is M and this is X here, if you look into delta A, first it will be split into a doublet. This is 1, 2, 2 J P P coupling P A P B and then here this is coupled with 6 of them are there. So, if 6 of them are equally coupled, so you should get 6 means 7 lines n plus 1 line should be there because i equals half. So, what you get is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Similarly, here also 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, something like this we get it and for uh, P m, So, this will be coupled with this one into triplet and then each triplet will be again accepted here. So, you can see this one. So, this is the NMR spectrum for this one and of course, here you can also ignore the coupling in this case, but anyway I have considered both small range coupling. Then if you go for this one here again, here these two are identical if you put A or if I put A here, this is M and this is X. I will show you spectrum here. You can see A to M X 6 space system as I said, these two do not show proton coupling I showed you there, but it will be something like this. Okay, it simply shows a doublet coupled with this one we are seeing here. This if you say A and this is M, this is delta A and then this is for delta P M. So, here first it shows a triplet and each line will be split and what you see here, this is your P H coupling. So, 2 bond, 1 to 2 bond coupling and this is 1 is to 2 is to 1 triplet and then we have each one is accepted. So, an AM to X3 you can see here and this triplet is for uh, this one if I say A, M and X. So, A will be delta P A will be a triplet here and then this coupling is 2 J P P. So, you are not seeing long range. If you see long range again, this will show a separate again. So, now the other one, uh, since both are identical, here not we are going to get separate, we are going to go only quadrate. So, each line in this one. So, if you take these two are coupled with this one to a doublet, something like this, and each doublet now, since this is identical with this one, only a quadrate will be seen. You see quadrate, and this is. J P H coupling. So, this is how you can interpret and you can identify if, if both the isomers are present in say 1 is to 1 ratio or 1 is to 3 ratio or whatever. So, we should be able to clearly distinguish them by using simply phosphorus NMR spectrum. Now, let us look into another interesting compound here. The reaction of zirconium tetrachloride DPPE, DPPE is bis diphenyl phosphenoethane with magnesium okay, dimethyl magnesium here gives a compound of this type where we have four methyl groups are there and DPP is there acting as a bidentate ligand. So, NMR spectra indicate that all methyl groups are equivalent. Draw octahedral and trigonal prism structures for the complex and show how the conclusion from NMR supports the trigonal prism assignment. So, this is very simple and it shows that this compound with the coordination number 6 can have both octahedral geometry and trigonal prismatic geometry. So, this is octahedral geometry here and 4 in the plane and 2 axial and also this octahedral compound geometry is also known as trigonal antiprismatic geometry, trigonal antiprismatic geometry. So, in this one if you try to arrange 4 methyl groups and bridging diphosphine, you cannot really come up with a isomeric form that has all 4 methyl groups equivalent. 
For example, to make them equivalent, I have to put all of them in the plane. When I put all of them in the plane, what happens? These two vertices will be far apart. It's very difficult to fix this diphenyl phosphoneethane in this vein because the ring size is not sufficient. So it can either go here. When it goes here, again, it will not be very symmetric. So from that point of view, what happens? It is ruled out. On the other hand, trigonal prismatic geometry, okay, all four can be, for example, this is a trigonal prismatic geometry, that is trigonal anti-prism. And of course, how to, how, why you can say prism is something like this, you can see. And then if I turn something like this, then it becomes trigonal anti-prism, staggered trigonal prism. So now with this one, what happens, let us say it has four rectangular faces are there. If four rectangular faces, let us say if I can put here very conveniently one, two, three, four methyl groups are there. And then if it is the bisphosphine, I can fix in this way. If I fix this way, what happens? Now we can see if I cut an axis here, this can divide and now both of them can be magnetic equivalent or I, if I do some rotation from this one, C2 axis of rotation, they will be identical. So that means with trigonal prismatic geometry, with this kind of conformation, what happens? All the four will be identical. That means when we look into 13 C NMR spectrum of this compound, it shows only one signal for all four carbon atoms. That clearly indicates that this compound has trigonal prismatic geometry with all methyl groups are in one plane, something like this. So we can conclude without any problem. So that means whatever the statement that is made in the question can be fulfilled by putting this kind of geometry here. And then of course these two phosphorus are identical. If you look into phosphorus NMR, it shows only one signal. And if you look into 13C NMR, and if you focus our attention to methyl groups, you'll get only one signal. So I have shown here, for example, here it has a different one and two type of, we will come back to axial and equatorial. Again, same thing is true here. And whereas here, trigonal prismatic, either you can see here or here, they look identical. And then you can see what I showed through these models. So this is how, once again, NMR can be used to understand the geometry and the preference of groups very readily by simply looking into the corresponding NMR spectra. So now I have another interesting reaction here. This is with tristrimethyl phosphine chloroiridium. So when the four coordinate square plane are complex, IRCl PMe3 tris, where PMe3 is trimethyl phosphine, you all know, reacts with chlorine two six coordinate products of formula IRCl3 PME thrice are formed. So that means we are adding oxidatively chlorine uh, to iridium one to form iridium three compound having six coordination from square plane or 16 electron, it forms a octahedral 18 electron complex. Iridium one changes from plus one to iridium plus three. So 31 PNMR spectra indicate one phosphorus environment in one of these isomers and two in the other, what isomers are possible? So when you look into MA3B3 type system, so we have MA3B3 system and of course when we have MA3B3 system and when we have MA4B2 system, so we know that two isomers are possible in case of octahedral compounds, of course here coordination number is uh, six. So in case of this one, we get facial and meridional isomers, whereas in this case we get cis and trans isomers. So since after oxidative addition, we are getting MA3B3 possible isomers are facial and meridional. And so that means here, uh, let us assume A is Cl and uh, B is PME3.
So now we have two isomers are there. You can clearly distinguish them. In this one, all A's are on one phase. So that all trimethylphosphines are one phase and all chlorines are in another phase. So this is a facial isomer and this is meridional. So we have trans as well as cis. So in this case, what happens if we just look into, we have two different type of phosphorus atoms are there. And then if you look into the spectrum here, this will give a triplet. And then whereas these two will show a doublet. So we get a pattern something like this, whereas in this one we get a singlet. So that means what it says, 31 PNMA spectrum indicate one element in one of these isomers. This is facial and two in the other. Two will be in case of meridional, one doublet and a triplet. So this is how we can identify simply by even not even plotting, simply by looking into the number of signals that are present. Of course, when we look into signals, we know that one has to be a doublet and one has to be a triplet. And then this doublet intensity should be, it should correspond to 2 and it should correspond to 1. Okay, so now there are a number of advantages for using 31 PNMR for reaction monitoring when available as compared to 1HNMR. It's very simple. You saw with several examples how simple it is to use phosphorus NMR as a tool for our advantage to understand the type of reaction we are doing and how to change the course of the reaction and all other details. Another advantage with phosphorus NMR spectroscopy is we don't need a deuterated solvent which simplifies the sample preparation and save time and resources. That means when we are doing a reaction, say continuous reaction, especially in homogeneous catalysis, let's say instead of doing batch reaction, we can take at regular intervals aliquot and we can look into if we have provided we have phosphorus moieties in it, we can readily monitor without going to expensive deuterated solvents. So 31 PNMR spectrum is simple and can be analyzed very quickly, much easier. So the corresponding 1H NMR spectra for the above reaction would include a number of overlapping peaks for the two phosphorus species as well as peaks for both free and bone cyclooctadiene ligand. So that means it is very simple here instead of going for 1H, one can conveniently go for phosphorus 31 PNMR spectra. So purification of product is also easy. And that means how we can purify all this information also comes from a spectroscopy. 31 PNMR does not eliminate need for 1H NMR characterization or impurities lacking phosphorus will not appear in 31 PN experiment. So basically what happens? 31P NMR does not eliminate the need for 1H NMR characterization, but as far as 31P NMR is concerned, if the spectrum is clean, that indicates that there are no phosphorus containing minor products or impurities. But on the other hand, there can be something else. So that means one should also confirm purity by going for 1H NMR or other nuclei NMR as well. So however, at the completion of the reaction, both the crude and purified products can be easily analyzed by both 1H NMR and 31P NMR spectroscopy. So let me stop and continue in my next lecture about many other NMR active nuclei, for example, 19F, 14N, 15N and other nuclei such as even boron. So let's continue a discussion on spectroscopy, especially NMR spectroscopy in my next lecture. Until then, have an excellent time. Thank you.